basically, I'm going to talk a little bit about the way fines get processed, um, how they're treated, how they're regarded, perhaps differently, depending on the different situations and types of site that we come across. Um, so we all know the value artefacts have um, in telling us and teaching us about the past and their fundamental use is dating evidence. Um, but are they always being treated in the same way? Are they processed in the same way in different organisations, units? Um, and are they fundamentally respected? And I can probably say the answer is probably no, <laughs> and it varies a lot. Um, a lot of so I will touch on some things that Dot has also covered because I am in a similar situation with why is this all still here and why are we keeping it all and so forth. Um, so I'm going to basically reflect on my own experiences um, through different avenues of work. Um, I've been a community archaeologist and now I'm a fines officer in a commercial unit. Um, so again, this is my views and opinions, not anyone I've worked with ever. So, you know, don't um, hold it against anyone I've come in contact with. Just like Dot was like, rant, rant, rant time. Um, um, so I'll address why things might be treated differently, highlight some of those biases that creep into the analysis that we carry out and highlight some of the issues and the challenges we face in fines processing and also about the problems that we always end up talking about that we probably don't really have an answer to because I also want an answer to Dot's question if anyone has it. Um, so the way get, fines get processed can actually vary depending on the project, who's involved in the project, what resources are available, etc. So this can vary from a commercial project processing to an established design in, in a unit or organisation. It might be a university who has a particular research focus or potential, so they're doing very something very specific and miss out other things. Or it might be more community, a local society, who may process it very intensively, but perhaps may lack some of the specialist skills in terms of identification and things like that. So the process can vary, which ultimately leads to some inconsistencies, some biases and some errors in the archaeological record. Um, processing should cover uh, several aspects of work, though not all of these are carried out for every collection. So in most cases, um, the material will come back to the lab or wherever, wherever it's been stored, it'll get washed and sorted and weighed and hopefully most of it will get photographed and catalogued in some way, so we have at least a basic record of it. Sometimes, but not always, um, the objects will get marked, um, maybe before, but usually once they're in a museum collection, and then it may take several years after that by, until curators get around to marking collections because they've got so much stuff to deal with. Um, Things sometimes get drawn, but normally only if they're going to go to publication, because again, drawing is time consuming and expensive. And then again, some limited scientific analysis, but that's usually selective and very specific to research projects. Um, but I'm very interested in the idea of doing XRF in terms of PAS and things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, how much processing gets done and is basically down to the time we've got, the resources we've got, what, methodolo what methodologies we're putting in place, um, the specialist skills and knowledge of the people that are processing it, as well as the significance um, of the assemblages. So I called my talk Community versus Commercial. Um, so I will touch on both these aspects, but I'm going to delve into different areas as I go. If we look at this from a community perspective, it often teaches us the ideal and complete way of dealing with assemblages, or at least in my experience it has. Um, on a commercial site, you often implement 100% collections policy, um, which can mean you end up with an awful lot of material to process. 
and tiny little bits of clay pipe and pot that would probably get missed or just left on a commercial site because they know you don't have time to process all those little tiny pieces and it just builds up and up. Um, but essentially on a community excavation we're taught that every object has value as much as the next one and all must be kept and processed and it's all this perfect system and it's not limited in any way like we used to think that everyone should, everything should go to a museum and now we know better because we've been doing it for too long. Um, the reality is that you end up with almost too much material to process. In fact, we do. Um, especially if there's tight timescales and budgets involved. With community projects as well, we also spend time engaging with the public, teaching volunteers skills and methods, which is fantastic, but it means the recording process can take a lot longer. Time and resources again. If the project's well-funded and resourced, this can result in excellent um, records and publications and outreach. Um, and it's a great way of bringing communities together. However, if the funding is tight or even non-existent, the results can be dampered. Um, collections might sit in certain places for years, perhaps with local societies and might not even get to the publication stage because there's no money to publish it, which is very unfortunate. And then if specialists haven't been involved in that work, again, there could be inconsistencies, lack of detail, identification, things like that. And community projects are usually dependent on getting external funding, which can have very, you have to have very specific research questions and meet the criteria for the organisation. So there's limitations and biases that creep in. Um, so generally you can get a lot of variation in quality in, commercial, in community work but this can also happen in commercial work as well. Um, with commercial projects <laughs> um, you're looking at the pile of it, well, most of it's pottery, actually. Um, Post-excavation work is basically dictated by the amount of funds allocated from the contractor in the project design when it's written up. I've realised that um, this is usually hugely underestimated, um, as it's almost impossible <laughs> to estimate how much material you're going to get from a community, community, commercial site, um, and therefore how much processing and post-excavation work is required. Um, it's also not seen as the most essential pressing part of the project because, you know, the project, the development needs to go forward, the archaeologist needs to dig it out and record it, and the post-ex comes after and sometimes get delayed or is underestimated in the importance and significance of it. So when this is underestimated and then we get huge collections in, we get these problems for the people processing it and in getting involved with it. So this is an example where they really had no, like, they should have had a better idea of how much potential material was going to get, come out of this site. But we now have 744 kilograms of artefacts from this site that's now sitting in our stores, waiting for me to process and then move to a museum, which is fine, but um, that is a huge job, which means I get delayed on other things. And yeah, it's, it's an issue. Um, the way finds are treated can also differ quite greatly on commercial sites, as I've seen in different situations. This can be down to the nature of the site and the period, but also down to the actual excavators who may or may not know that much about fines or care about fines. Um, so things can be overlooked or not collected if people aren't being meticulous and there isn't somebody there that knows the potential significance of the artefacts on site. Um, I'm not going to go into any examples. <laughs> um, but in, is, in essence, assemblage need, assemblages need to be footy, fully catalogued and their overall significance assessed and a post-excavation assessment written 
highlighting any further or specialist work that's required, for instance, things like writing specialist pottery report. Historic England have recently carried out a review of the standards of reporting on archaeological artefacts in England, which uh, came out in 2017. I think they reviewed about a thousand fine specialist reports um, across the country and discovered that the style and quality vary quite considerably, depending who's written it, um, what part of the country they're from, which is, um, I don't know if it's quite surprising, but um, it, again, that is an issue that there's such variation in consistencies in how we as specialists and archaeologists are even writing these projects up. Um, and that's often down to who they've got to write it up, um, what specialists they've got in their organisations and so on. So at the moment, there's not really one single way of doing things. You often get people kind of almost set in their own ways, recording things, how they see the process to be. Um, so it varies depending on where you're working and doing things. Um, I guess my point is there needs to be a greater consistency in how find reports are produced and written. Um, that's something to work on. So, as well as these inconsistencies, there's some biases that creep into the recording process. So this can happen straight away on site when people are almost choosing what to leave and what to bring back, which I try and get them to understand um, um, what is and what, is, what isn't important. Um, the biases can also be based on material type and period. So there's still people that think on site that if it's not Roman or medieval, then why am I bringing it back? Because we've got loads of this stuff. But they don't have that specific knowledge about perhaps the site or the local region or, you know, the diggers haven't done all of the DBA work. So they can't, they don't have the information to make those decisions and they shouldn't be making those decisions um, also bias comes in when we have to make decisions about what goes to specialist report stage and how we decide what's significant and what is not significant so the challenge is deciding and justifying how we deem that significance um, and how we justify spending the money on the publications. This comes to another challenge that I've become aware of since working in commercial work is a lack of specialists, um, which is another ongoing problem. This is just, I don't know if there's a very specific project that's looked into low, um, active specialists. If anyone knows of one, please let me know, because this is just off the Badger website where people can register their specialisms. So I know not everyone's on here, but like, um, you can clearly see the difference with um, ceramics and clay pipes around the UK. There's only six registered clay pipe specialists, but I know for a fact that there's more. But just the contrast shows um, there's only really a handful across the whole country. Yeah. And we're not actively um, training people up. A lot of these specialists have been around for years. Units use the same specialists over and over. What do we do when these people retire? Most of them are freelance. They don't have a protege or um, apprentice or whatever. That would be fantastic if we could get fines apprenticeships. But, you know, no one even wants curators in museums anymore. So how are we going to fund that? Rant. <laughs> um, so this is yet another problem. What do we do about specialists? Some people struggle right now finding specialists for very specific materials um, and it ends up with fines officers and curators have to end up being a jack of all trades and try and develop specialisms and try and cover as much as possible and nobody can do everything so again it's another challenge I'll only briefly mention this because Doc talked a lot about archives and what the future, how, how we can store all this enormous material. And I know we justify it by saying that there's always going to be a new machine or a new technique that can 
process it again. But I, it can't go on forever, and it's so frustrating being a fines officer when you go to a museum and they're like, we can't take anything. I mean, I've got several assemblages that I know are regionally significant, and my dread is that someone's going to say, well, we can't store it, because I can't throw it away. And we only have a certain amount of space. Units can't become museums. But that's where it's going. It really is. The units are just full of stuff because museums can't take them. And it just... I don't know what the solution is to that. Because I don't want to throw things away. We need... I think we need a working committee on that. <laughs> or something. Um, yeah. I don't know what we do about that. Um, but in terms of what we do keep i do think museums need a sweep and a clean out because they do have a lot of insignif insignificant material or repeated material that no one's looked at for 30 40 years and we're finding more and more important things that should be there instead really so it really should be research focused there's things like the regional regional research frameworks that really focus on um important gaps in research and that's where retainment should be focused and um, projects should be focusing um, and we don't need boxes and boxes of buckley where dark glazed mm -hmm. courseware that are from plough soils what's it going to tell you um, yeah this is turning into more of a rant than I thought it would be um, to conclude <laughs> um, Fines can be treated and recorded quite differently in different situations. Um, regardless of the situation, they should always be treated with respect, an essential part of the record. I love the idea of doing some kind of digital record. Um, the capacity of it and how we do it is another question. Um, collection and retention of fines should be research-led. And the future of assemblage should be thought about at each stage of excavation and analysis. Um, we are at bursting point and we do need a clear of archives, especially of things that have limited or no future research potential. Um, we may not be able to retain everything in a physical format. We only have so much room, but it's crucial that finds are recorded to the best of our abilities and in as much detail as possible in different formats and media with a greater consistency and standardisation across the country. Thank you.